Morning. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've all been able to join some of the other sessions as part of the Connected um, on Ability um, Disability um, History Month Festival. There's been some uh, fantastic, amazing sessions. It's a um, great partnership between our council partners, um, Airedale, um, across the board, uh, Equalities Together, um, some really great partners and stories, uh, powerful stories of lived experiences. So myself and my colleague Ruth today are coming together with you to look at um, and explore um, BTHFT's approach to disability um, declaration um, and speak to you a little bit about that and have an open discussion. Um, so yeah, so my name is um, Sonia Sarah, for those that may have not have met me. Um, I'm an EDI manager at Bradford Teaching Hospitals Trust um, and I work alongside my colleague Ruth A and uh, Kese Art, uh, who's the head of EDI here. So welcome here today and um, yes, I'll um, I think pass over to Ruth, who will um, start the session, if that's OK. Hi. Hey there, <laughs> Oops, sorry. My microphone had gone off then. Hi, everyone. I'm Ruth Haig. I'm EDI manager working alongside Sonia at Bradford Teaching Hospitals. I'll just share my slides. So um, I've got a few slides. There's a few. It's <laughs> quite, a, quite a few slides. I'll sort of go through them fairly quickly. Um, around the importance of uh, disability declaration um, in the NHS and also um, there we go. So we're going to have a look around what equality monitoring is and the importance of sharing that um, very personal data um, with your employer. Um, I'm going to look at what's classed as a disability and how sharing information about this with your employer can actually benefit um, employees themselves and to explore the challenges that we faced at Bradford Teaching Hospitals um, and what action we've taken to address those challenges. Um, and then obviously um, what we want to do is then open that up for, for discussion with yourselves um, around your experiences um, and sort of sharing best practice and around encouraging employees to declare their disability. So what is equality monitoring and why is it important? Um, so equality monitoring is collection, retention, analysis of data around protected characteristics. And I'll come on to talk about what protected characteristics are um, and that are within a given workforce. So by collecting that information, it allows us as an employer to highlight possible inequalities within our workforce. So we can investigate causes of potential disadvantage. So we can, what we can do is we can cross reference that data. So, for example, if we know how many people we've got from a certain group of protected characteristics, we can look at recruitment data, for example, and see if we're actually recruiting people, if people are getting to the shortlisting stage, if they're if they're actually being appointed at interview. And if that's not happening, then we can start to analyse why that's not happening and is it something that we're doing? Is it barriers that we're putting in place? So it's really important from that sort of perspective. Um, it also allows us to direct employee services to where the need is greatest. Um, so if if we know that we have people with a particular disability um, in one area or then we know that we have we need sufficient support services available to meet meet any needs that might be there. Um, if we if we know we've got a number of people with a disability, then we know that we're going to need um, a team of staff who were who were available to support on reasonable adjustments, for example. And we know that we need that resource. Um, this helps us to fulfil our duty as a supportive employer, meeting the requirements of the Equality Act, which I'll cover in a second. And it also allows us to promote and celebrate, so we can engage with um, with um, certain groups of staff and promote and celebrate along with those members of staff the diversity in our workforce. So when we talk about the Equality Act um, and protected characteristics, apologies if if you know you're probably already quite aware of this. So there's nine protected characteristics um, that are protected by the Equality Act. Um, and so it's it's actually illegal to discriminate on the basis of uh, for example, age, gender, gender reassignment, race. I, I won't read them all out. Um, 
on the basis of any of those those characteristics or if somebody perceives that you have one of those characteristics as well then disability is one that's slightly different there as well um, because if you are discriminated because um, you for example have caring responsibilities you're supporting somebody who has a disability then um, discrimination by association um, is also protected by the Equality Act. So that's a really great piece of legislation. Um, as a public sector employee, as part of that legislation, we also have an additional responsibilities, um, and that's to ensure that we are always working towards eliminating discrimination, harassment and victimisation, the main basis of the, of the Act, but also that we're looking to advance equality of opportunity among people with protected characteristics and fostering good relationships between those who have them and those who don't. So we should always be trying to raise the profile of, for example, disability equality or race equality within our organisation um, and to engender understanding between members of staff. So having a thorough picture of the makeup of our workforce through equality monitoring will help us to achieve the aims of the public sector equality duty. So what do we mean when we talk about a disability? Um, so this is a physical or mental impairment, and this is the definition of the Act, from the Act. Um, that something that has a substantial or long-term ad adverse effect on a person's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. So things like dressing, um, anything that other, otherwise people would normally take for granted. Um, it needs to be something that's substantial, so not something that's sort of minor or trivial, and it needs to be something that's long term. So, for example, if you've had an operation and you're out of action for a couple of months, that wouldn't be a disability, obviously, that you're just recuperating from an operation there. But if there's something that happens as a result of that, that, that means that you have a long term impairment that then lasts for 12 months or more, then that could be classed as a disability. Um, and then there are also some conditions that are automatically classed as a disability under the Act. Things like, oh, well, it's not CANA, it should be cancer there, um, HIV, multiple sclerosis, so certain things. And, and when we, we talk about people having a disability, the, the Equality Act requires that we consider reasonable adjustments for somebody if those things are needed. So providing support um, for, for employees in the work workplace. Um, as far as we possibly can. So we often find that many people with what would be classed as a disability under the Act um, maybe don't even think of themselves as having a disability. Um, it's just it's part of who they are. It's something that they live with um, and maybe they don't feel the need to share that information um, and, and rightly so in some cases. However, um, obviously that discomfort um, you need to consider some of the benefits of disclosing that information. So it's not just about putting yourself, um, put, applying a label to yourself. Um, it's about ensuring that we as an employer can take positive action to improve the lives for all our staff um, in the longer term. And, and also to ensure that, that you as employees um, have the best experience possible at work and able to reach your priority, uh, your potential at work as well, um, and don't experience any kind of disadvantage. So it shouldn't matter um, what um, that you have a disability. It shouldn't, you know, your your potential at work should be based on experience, ability, skill. Um, you know, you might say, well, doesn't declaring that create bias in itself? However. From analysis of the information that we have experience shows um, that things like ethnicity, sexuality, physical or mental ability does seem to affect how they're treated by others. It shouldn't be the case but it is so equality monitoring allows us as an employer then to highlight those differences um, and to investigate the root causes of any sort of disadvantage and address them in a way that empowers staff rather than dis disempowering staff. Um, it can also benefit 
yourself as an employee. So being open can actually provide a prompt to start initial discussions with your line manager about workplace support. Um, you you know you there may be things that are there in terms of support that you perhaps hadn't imagined could could be there to support you so by having that open conversation you know you you're enabling your manager or empowering your manager to provide you with that support so you can have discussions around things like um disability related reasonable adjustments flexible working home working um, maybe if you need some time to assist with caring responsibilities, there are policies in place to support that. That openness also allows the employer to identify wider issues faced by the workforce, as we've discussed. Uh, so in all, so contributing your personal diversity information means that ultimately everybody will have a better experience. Obviously, one of the main concerns that people have is that if they disclose that personal information, that they'll be at some kind of disadvantage. Um, and, and we need to reassure people that on a personal level, if you're declaring information to the electronic staff record, um, you actually don't even need to disclose that to your manager. You can update that onto the electronic staff record system confidentially. That information is only visible centrally to a, number, a small number of HR staff who have access to that information as part of their role, who may be involved in analysing that data and maybe sharing some of that data at a very high level um, to sort of empower um, managers to then take positive action where we feel that, that, that that's needed. And that information is handled in strict confidence um, and in accordance with the general data protection regulations. So it's not accessible by the manager. However, we do also encourage you, as I've said, to share that information with your manager where you see that it's, it's relevant. So if you're working in the NHS, you can share that information on your electronic staff record. So by logging in and then in the left hand column there on the portal, there's a section called my personal information. And you can just update that there to to ensure that that's accurate. So here at Bradford Teaching Hospitals, we've we've got a commitment to building an equitable and ex inclusive workplace. Um, you might be able to see on my my uh, background there our strap line, which is that we value diversity and champion inclusion. So we take that very seriously here at the Trust. We want everybody to feel that they belong here and that they can bring their whole selves to work. Obviously, we know that we've got work to do um, around this, um, but I want to just talk to you a little bit about the sorts of things that we're doing. We, we know we've got work to do because our staff survey results have shown that 23% of survey respondents declare a disability. We also know that we only have around 37% response rate for the staff survey. So, you know, that might not even be accurate in itself. And then our electronic staff record consistently tells us that we only have 4% of staff who, who have declared a disability. So there's a real disconnect there. We know that we've got work to do on that um, to increase the confidence of staff to feel that they are able to to talk openly about their personal characteristics. So one of the things that we did is we launched an equality census campaign to encourage more staff to share their personal diversity information more openly with the trust. Um, we created a printed booklet which includes some of the information that I've included in this presentation. Um, we shared that via the internal communication systems on the internet and we've also with the printed booklet we can take it to events. Um, physical events, face to face events that we attend. Um, we also developed a screensaver to publicise that, which we sort of roll out on a on a six monthly basis. But we know that the most important thing there that provides you with the information, what we need to do is really is engage with our staff and work to raise a profile of disability equality in the trust. One so that we can empower managers so that understanding is there around people's lived experiences but also providing staff with that confidence to declare a disability. 
And my colleague Sonia is going to just talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done to raise the profile of disability equality at Bradford Teaching Hospitals. Thank you, Ruth. And hi there, everyone. Um, so, yeah, in terms of our approach to raising the profile of disability equality at BTHFT, we've um, worked on the development and the rollout of a disability equality and disability leave policy. We, uh, myself and Ruth, are currently finalising and working on our EDI training, half a day training for managers at the Trust, which will be in unison with our um, OD team and our wider sort of education team. So it'll be a rollout um, consistently once every quarter. So we'll be looking to hopefully have the first rollout come February time. Um, my kind of role within the Trust, I mean, I've been um, in the NHS and I'm not from an NHS background originally. Um, I came from a youth community development, um, higher education background, um, and I came into the Trust about a year ago. And uh, my role, um, I'm part time, um, two and a half days a week, but my core role is centred on engagement um, and um, really focused on reviewing, refreshing and relaunching our three staff equality networks. So at the Trust here, we have um, Enable, which is our um, disability, long term health conditions. And it's the broad umbrella of it. We we sort of um, invite people who through disability by association as well. So it's a wider breadth. And in our reviewed and fresh terms of reference that we've worked with the members with, um, we've revamped some of the language around that to ensure that um, it's a, an inviting platform for all our staff in the various capacities of of um, Sort of caring roles or uh, for, for hidden disabilities or long-term conditions as well so yes yeah, so we've um, focused on um, reviewing and relaunching the staff networks which was centered on the um, national day of staff networks on 11th of may um, we've got um, the lgbt plus network which are in to your minds about changing the name maybe to the rainbow network so we're still in they're still developing that uh, we've got our race equality network which is called resin which is our race equality staff engagement network um so my my role has really been centered on sort of supporting the staff networks because there's a real power in the platform of um staff networks and what they can achieve and with our staff equality networks the chair and the deputy chair ha um they have a role on our um Equality Diversity Council, which meets every quarter, which our C CEO, um, Mel Pickup Chairs. So it's a real thing for me, and it's really passionate about kind of my working practices in community engagement in sort of youth, youth from the youth service through my formative years to working for anti racist charities to coming into academia and beyond. It's really about the power of that grassroots experience and how to make sure we reach the senior level um, so real change can be effective and made regarding um, um, the, the, the umbrella of our uh, of the um, the networks that we have. Um, so yes, yeah, so, um, we have a new chair for um, our Enable Network, which is um, Sarah Schroeder. I don't think she's able to join us today, um, but we're doing some really great engagement work because we realise we, with um, Enable in particular, we're taking a different approach because a lot of our staff are actually, um, you know, we are working from home. The winter season is, is harder with people um, and looking at a different approach to how we better engage um, staff and, um, and have new members feel it's a safe space for them to come to. Um, we have, um, I'm supporting the, all the networks on developing work plans aligned to the trust EDI objectives. Um, the, the chair or the deputy chair in absence can attend the strategic meetings at People Academy um, to make sure that the, the real voices of our of our um, colleagues within the networks are being represented and followed through um, in, a, in a very um, in a way that's cohesive and that makes sense and that is at the heart of um, the colleagues experiences. Um, we've had a revamp of new branding, all the networks have worked on their um, new logos and as you can see um, this is the new logo that's been devised by um, the Enable Staff Network to um, represent sort of hidden disabilities um, within the wide, within sort of their idea of how to represent that in a way that's quite wonderful actually from the initial one we started with. Um, and also what we've, um, 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 through the management sort of tiers, we've um, been able to uh, sort out protected time for core network group members, which is four hours per month, which is really vital because we have to remember that um, the staff, the colleagues that are in the core roles. So we have we have currently four core roles that we're still uh, working with our members to um, 
um, sort of draw. We have like a, a chair, a deputy chair, a comms officer and a secretary. Now, some of the positions like the LGBT network, we have all of them roles allocated, but people move on in jobs and this kind of thing. So it's a constant kind of um, invitation, I guess, to make sure we we are in, uh, inclusively um, inviting um, members in a way that works for them and to ease that pressure. And I think it's something about networks where people can dip in and dip out. That is the power and the, the wonder of it all, I think. And it's just having um, like that slight symbiotic link of just having someone there. And I see my role to be that, to make sure that they're fully supported um, and, and sort of advocate where I can and sort of, um, yeah, push forward um, the voices and, and the um, the work plans and the areas that, that um, the group members put forward. Um, the, the group have now we've um, sorted our network budget for each of our staff networks. It's not much. We, we were we were pushing forward for a bit more. We wanted two thousand per network for for the year. We've managed to get one thousand, which is a start. I think it's a, it's a good start at least. So um, we're hoping through the network activities the networks want to do that they can highlight um, highlight that. So we um, as part of Enable, we've done a consultation exercise in the main concourse at BRI last week, I believe. Um, which is to sort of look around some of the, um, I guess, the barriers to engagement, the what are the, what are the, uh, the fears around, you know, sort of disability and declaration and and how people feel. So we've done a bit of a consultation exercise, which Sarah is kind of um, pulling together and we're running a session tomorrow on um, what people are wanting to know about disability but afraid to ask. So that's going to be more of an open platform, um, sort of a discussion area. Um, and yes, Rufa, please, next slide, please. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so one of my, I guess my core roles has also been, first when I came into um, into the Trust about a year ago, um, the first, one of the core objectives was to work on um, writing a funding bid. So we were really, we were successful in that funding bid. It was a bid um, to NHS England for um, the Innovation Fund, the DES, the work, the DES stands for the Workforce Disability Equality Standard. We were one of the 10 trusts that won one of the successful bids. Um, and it's actually been a really exciting project but because for me and um, being sort of in Enable and in terms of intersectionality with the race quality network and me being a single parent um, and as I care for my mum, the cross sections of all that is really at the heart and soul of why I do what I do. Being in EDI and being within the roles of working with staff equality networks is at the heart of um, it goes beyond a job. It's really you've lived it, you've breathed it through your formative years. Um, with Enable myself, I bring in my own lived experiences of not only just being a carer for my mum, but because um, I'm palliative care now, but um, also um, I have a, um, a long term condition myself, which is an autoimmune condition, which on face value, nobody would know. Like you wouldn't know. But with me and my team, we've got such a great environment with Cares and Ruth and, my, and myself that if I get really unwell, if I get poorly, I get quite unwell and I can be flawed. But it's having that really good communication channel to be able to have a space of shared vulnerability, but for it to be a place of strength, to say, this is what's going on, how best could can I be supported within my job and my role to make sure that we function as a team, but I get the right support I need. So I'm bringing myself into this in, in how I approach this and why sort of declaration and discipline declaration is very important um, within this within this, this remit. So um, coming back to the innovation fund, um, we um, we did a, a creative multimedia sort of a campaign. We we looked to sort of raise the profile of disability equality and we had six contributors on this project. Um, and we wanted to cover the breadth of kind of um, sort of, sort of from hidden disabilities to learning difficulties and challenges um, to a physical um, disability to being a carer, you know, a, care, a disability by association. So if you're a carer and we tried to show the, the breadth of that through the colleagues and through their different levels and roles within the trust. And it's quite a powerful, uh, poignant piece. Um, some of you may have already seen the video that's that's gone out there. We've actually just recently had the exhibition um, put up, we hosted um, uh, Kim Parsons from NHS England and they were actually really quite impressed with, with the display. It's going to be, it's a travelling photographic exhibition. So we're wanting to, in the new year, um, work with our HR recruitment drive, with our partners, partners for our festival as well that we're working on um, and with our RD team to, to look at bringing this and doing a smaller pop-up version of the bigger showpiece that can go out to community centres to show actually that jobs in the NHS 
are for you because I'll be honest when I went for this job I had a really good circle of friends behind me I'd taken a career break I'd single parent I was looking after my mum I was really poorly and it was kind of a weighing it up like to you know can I just launch myself back out of the how will I manage I've got three boys um it's quite tough as a single parent it's quite tough as a carer but I had a good supportive people around me show showing me that actually my lived experiences are what's needed in, in a role like in EDI um, and sometimes it's having that and knowing that within a, an organisation you have these voices and why staff equality networks are vitally important it's knowing there's a safe, a safe platform to share a level of vulnerability in a safe space to action that to look at the um, the, the needs um, uh, beyond 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 sort of coming together it's actually what are the key objectives for be it disability equality race equality LGBT equality and having um, a cohort of people that really understand that but they're not only just having the understanding it's about the scalability measurability deliverability making sure everyone there's a seat at the platforms that matter which are the levels of seniority as well so that's kind of kind of my role into that so um with, with this project it's it's something about for me it's really about um when i when i wrote that when we looked right in the bid um with my team that whole thing of a travelling photography exhibition and a living library's carousel. A living library's carousel for me, we had our um recent we had our um on the Wednesday we did our sort of showcasing of um the project. It's really about lived experiences. For me, a living library's carousel is about having a sort of um I think in my head, I used to grow grew up in Salter, there used to be a fairground at the top of Saltaire. And I've got really fond memories of that. And that was kind of my vision behind it. It's that whole idea of coming together and being able to share in a safe space and and kind of being able to come together and through the power of lived experiences there's relatability it resonates strongly with people and that was at the heart of this project in essence um part, and i guess part of that project as well um we've actually had there was a, on the wednesday of this week as part of display history month nhs england had a disability summit um and the video for our disability equality at bthft uh, part of the innovation fund was played on a loop throughout that day um I, I believe it was played on a loop of that day so um it's received really well it, it's been um i think regionally it's been received really well um has had a meeting with um sort of the chief people's officer Navina Evans and it was received really well um by them as well so there'll be sort of a wider national rollout with with this and it's actually going to inform it's informed the development of the EDI managers half day training that Ruth and I are finalizing and working on so it's very proactive ways of how we can utilize the the um learning from this project and the voices of the colleagues that have contributed um in an active way in a way that's um at the heart of the practice and the ethos of um of equality work and uh, equity work in the field um we yes yeah, so we're also yes yeah, so there'll be with the EDI training there'll be also dropping sessions for managers and staff as well and we're in a, we'll be doing a pilot um pilot rollout of it before we do the formalised training for our staff here at BTHFT. So thank you Ruth. Next slide please. There we go. So, yeah so I know um, it's, we want to really centre the latter half of our, uh, the session today because I feel like it's a lot of information giving. There's a lot there to for us to sort of um, relate to relate to here on the call today. But what we want to do is sort of hone that back in a little bit now to look at um, a sort of an open space discussion, really. Um, and I guess one of the first questions just to put out there and um, um, sort of Ruth and I can sort of take take some hands or some questions or just feel free to to come in, you know, um, that's fine. Um, is to look at for, for those of you that are involved in maybe collecting and compiling data for your workforce within your organisations. So what's your what's your um, actual experience? Um, what do you feel are the barriers for staff in sharing their personal diversity information? And um, and I guess what so I'll just throw all the questions out there that we can sort of lead into an open sort of space discussion is and also what steps can we take to make this process easier and more effective all around. So yeah, thank you. So I can see Bo, your hand is up. So if you'd love to come shall in, that'd be, that'd be grand. Shall thank I you. stop sharing the slides, Sonia, so we can see each yeah, other? Yeah, that's fine. We can see each yeah, other. That'd be, really, that'd be better. That. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Sonia and uh, Ruth. Really informative and great presentation. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Bo Eskrit and I'm head of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at Bradford District Care Trust. Um, so I guess I'm really involved in collecting that data, um, uh, the diversity data and being able to use that to drive change, uh, see the gaps. Um, but the feedback I've had around um, collecting data, and this is uh, a quality monitoring data, is around people not knowing what's going to happen to that data. Is it confidential um, and, that, and that sort of thing? Um, so um, that has been my experience. Um, and there was also some uh, research done by NHS employers, and this is um, the head of uh, equality, he put out a survey around disability uh, uh, maybe last year, uh, why people weren't completing their declarations around disability, why there was a, um, a, a real gap uh, uh, around why people will disclose it in the staff survey, yet when you look at your um, declarations, it's a lot lower. Um, and, and I think the feedback was that some people didn't know how to do that. Uh, um, in the NHS we have this self-service ESR um, and, and it was around people not knowing how, how to do that. So that I guess there's two things about knowing how to do it and also what's going to happen to the data. Thank you. Thanks Bo, some really good points. Uh, lovely to see you on the meeting today, hi. Um, yeah. I think I think that's really helpful to know because in terms of the feedback um, that you've had around people struggling with with the confidentiality and understanding that that sort of tells us that perhaps the booklet that we've created is probably going to be helpful. But what we need to do is work on getting that out there a little bit more and spreading the word a little bit more that actually that information is is treated with confidence. Um, and unless you actually want to share that and have that open conversation with your manager, you can at least share that information on ESR in confidence. And, and, and that is still beneficial in terms of the organisation, in terms of advancing disability equality in the trust. Um, and again, the, the, the survey from NHS employers, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, mm. Yeah, people, again, not, not knowing how to do that, yeah. um, who may may see yeah. the benefit in sharing that information, but yeah. probably not having the confidence even to ask yeah. how how to um, update yeah. that information on their yeah. record. And I think Anybody else want to come in on that? Yeah, sorry, I've just yeah. wanted to one little put a thing just in sort of my thought process is um, I think there's a real sense of how to having a more innovative approach is to building that trust value within um, declaration because in sort of working with um, the Enable Staff Network in particular, there is still a reticence and a fear around disclosure and how that will impact on career progression, on how that will impact on, um, you know, I mean, it's still kind of a tel delicate challenge of time in the winter season here at the Trust. As an acute hospital trust, the winter season challenges that are upon us. Um, and I think there's a real fear of, by disclosure, what that will mean in terms of intimate training structures, you know, how that will function, functionality, and where that will, um, stop, you know, that fear is about stoppage to career progression. And that is actually a real fear. It really is a real fear within the Enable Network. And I think there's something about approaching and, and, and communicating some of this across. So maybe some of the sessions that Ruth and I might look to sort of run or sort of an offshoot from our EDI training, maybe to look at how to, um, through that consultative process of how to better build that trust because that trust value mm. is quite core to people wanting to share something so personal mm. about themselves I think when it comes to disability declaration and I mean the the, the you know staff survey the actual levels that we're getting speak for itself I mean like, like Ruth said only 37 people percent haven't filled in the forms so actually how do we know it's representative of the actual you know the, the figures are, are a bit off skew aren't they in that sense so I think there's a lot of work to be done in building trust, I think it's it, the centre for me for focus on trust value so people feel safe enough to disclose and safe enough so they don't feel impinged on in terms of their career route, career progression. It's something about psychological safety as well, I believe, um, and creating that culture within practices because for the best will of the world, I think there's a real sense of we all know how to 
you know, really create inclusive practices. But when it's a clinical challenging environment in teams, the pressures are on. So the challenge for us in EDI, I would say for myself, Ruth and kids and our specific kind of role here at BTHFT is making sure that we support the managers, the middle managers um, and across the board, the, um, you know, grassroots staff that are feeling it. And, you know, I think there's a real self of how do we move from a sense of psychological self-preservation as an individual in a, an organisation or a trust to psychological safety where people within wider teams feel able to go back to bringing their whole selves to work in a sense that feels safe, secure um, and yeah and and you know and actually authentic and meaningful and impactful. So that was just one little thing I just wanted to say but thank you thank Sorry. you Bo and I can, can and we can see we have a hand up yeah. don't we yes yeah. Hiya, um, I'm a disability employment advisor at um, the job centre. I didn't realise this was um, going to be specifically about um, disability declaration within the um, health trust. But um, so I, I've been listening and a lot of my customers and obviously this may not be relevant for yourself, but I'm going to put a question out there. Um, because a lot of my customers, when I ask them if they've got a disability or health condition, they will say no, even though they have been diagnosed with autism or general learning disabilities or Asperger's or some other aspect um, that is within the Equality Act, because as far as they're concerned, that is their norm. It isn't anything different, so maybe some of your employees think like that. Um, no, I don't have an health condition. That's my everyday norm and I have nothing to tell you. Um, but that, as I say, may not be relevant given the different level of people that we may be dealing with. Um, well, I think this this session's open to everybody. Um, Carol, thanks very much yeah. for sharing that with us. Um, I think that's really interesting, and I think it does tell you something a little bit about um, how we ask for that information, um, because it isn't about applying a label to somebody. It's about us understanding the needs of people who are either accessing services in your case or people who are um, employ you know who are mm. our employees in our case um, yeah. and I think it's about not just asking that question and asking no. them to tick a box yeah. but understanding As what we mean by that why we're asking for it probably and and what the significance of it is you know what we would, would be using that information for but that's just that's just my, yeah. my sort of reflection on that I think Carol yeah I Thank do you. know that when I when I talk to my customers I do dig because obviously I have an instinct as to whether there is, is a disability before I ask the question um, and I do dig and we do find out you know did you go to a special school did you have this support school and all the rest of it but they still see that as their norm um, yeah, and absolutely. it's the same with a lot of, of you know I don't know anyway I'm going to shut up <laughs> Thanks, that's great, Carol. But I think it, it's about understand people understanding well what what is a disability. It's not that we're wanting to apply that label and why are, why we want why are we even asking for that information. Um, I think that's really important. Thank you, Bo. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I, th I thought Carol raised some really good um, uh, points there because um, you know uh, people's perception of what a disability is. Um, some people would refer to having a long term condition, health condition, which isn't, you know, and may not see uh, uh, it as, a, you know, disability um, and also perception around. I, I, I feel there's there's more um, sort of acknowledgement possibly around physical uh, disability. Um, we're just coming into the severe now of neurodiversity and invisible disabilities. I mean, even the sign for disability is someone in a wheelchair, you know, so that sort of uh, perception. Um, I I'm not sure that, um, you know, we're up to date in, in all aspects and this is um, uh, things around definition and 
uh, for for um, I'm not sure that the sort of the the um, perception has caught up with sort of the reality of you know what we might consider a disability now um, and also other uses of terms I'm dyslexic but I would say I've got a learning difficulty you know that sort of thing and whether that those uh, those different sort of terminologies can uh, I think cause some sort of uh, disparities there around people's thinking and perceptions. Thank you. Yes, and I think I'm just going to, I'll just come in really quickly before I know Tanya's hand is raised as well. Um, it's something that we've we've enabled in um, sort of our uh, their their meetings is a real sense of actually is the fact um, is it it was raised by one of our uh, sort of core members is it putting people um, kind of kitting that sense of you know people don't feel it's a, it's um, a network for them because perhaps they don't see you know they don't feel like um, the language fits kind of how they sort of relate to to their lives I think and uh, to, to life and I think for myself I mean I can speak from my own lived experience I would be having a an autoimmune long-term health condition which is sort of a gynecological one it's kind of, it's really hard to sort of articulate that I feel I mean, I I see myself. So, we, we, to give you an example, with um, the refreshing of the network in a sort of practical sense, that's why the terms of reference were, were really rehashed because it was to the, the members really wanted to feel it needs to encompass long term conditions, disability by association. So, it, they really sort of worked on that to sort of free a, a, a sequence of a consultative phase um, earlier this year to make sure that it kind of encompass the language better language that felt able in terms of relatability to engage more people because it's something we're looking at now you know i mean we still are because it's the one network where people will just um you know um it's harder to engage i think engage because i think within the trust for us here it's it's um it's hard to time with the winter season and everything but people have to come in on the meetings but um and just have that support and maybe that's where we're at right now it's just to be a safe uh, safe, a safe space for people to feel supported but i think um uh, you know i think with the um i guess with the job center on that side of it i mean i've had experiences where i think people are scared as well and this is through different experiences not related to my job but um you know, like stuff like peak claimants or things around trying to go back to work and managing that there's a real fear around what support you can get especially when it comes to sort of I know it's a little bit off topic but when it mm. comes to what you are able to receive in terms of your benefits what support is out there for you to live a healthy lifestyle free work but be you, know, you can still be playing paper and be working or there's a real fear around that mm. because of how benefits have the agents have treated people I know first hand my mum was treated when she um you know, she she'd had stroke after stroke, and the, the denied her the one thing she should have been entitled to, and it broke her. She was broken for that process. Did not want access services again. I've advocated. I was the one to write that um, did the secondary forms and things. And my mum is now sort of on dialysis, had stroke after stroke. She didn't want the pressure of having to manage that. I mean, pressurised to go back to work. She had a stroke. They made her go to volunteer in the community centre, and she had a stroke there because it pressured her that she'd get up this little bit of money, that she'd be, you know, have to have certain remits made. I think the wider discourse beyond working in hospital, and I guess why I'm in the field that I'm in, is really about changing that discourse and the language around it all, because it feels like it's really inquisitive all the time. I do There's understand that, there. Sonia. I do understand that. I have yeah. got people with health conditions within my yes. family. My mother has yes. MS and my daughter yes. is yeah. diagnosed autistic. And in order to get the support she needed, we had to go through an yes. industrial, uh, not an industrial yes. tribunal, a tribunal for PIP. Yes. So yes. I do yes. understand that from a personal level. And that is yes. part of my role to support yes. people to access the benefits that they are entitled to, which is why my job role is different. It's yes, disability yeah. employment advisor, which means I try to support people to get into work if they've got a disability okay, or yes. health condition. That's if they want to move that way. If they don't want yeah. to move that way, I think there is other ways that we can move. But at the moment, that is where I am. I'm not a work coach. I'm not all about getting into work. I'm all about disabilities and supporting the customer. And that's the way that I work. 
you know, and I do know that out there, the job centre has got a bad reputation of thinking work, work, work. But some of the customers I've had, I mean, I've had responses from some people who have said, you know, you've saved my life. Thank you. You know, and when you get responses like that, and that was a mental health person, um, somebody who had schizophrenia that had come off his meds. Um, sending you a message saying thank you for your support you've you you know i've you've saved my life that is so good to me so that sort of thing is the support that i specifically do and my team do um but yeah i think it's anyway. vital to, it's vital sorry um carol it's, you know thank you so much for what you're doing and in your role i think it's this this is the wider conversation why, why mm. i guess the festival has been put together by the key partners and zara's here as well and um you know one of the key partners in in sort of uh, pulling this festival together and i think it's it's about that holistic approach um you know with, this is a specific session but it's, it's a wider it's a wider yeah it, it goes is. beyond all that doesn't it so yeah yeah I'm sorry i know i've spoken of quite a bit there but i know tanya's had a hand raised for a while so do you apologize tanya but do you come in Hi Sonia, thank you and thank you everyone for your contributions. It's been really interesting to sit in on this and listen and, and I'm also from outside the NHS. I work for um, a housing association, a not-for-profit housing association in the southeast of England and my role within the organisation is the uh, equality, diversity and inclusion delivery partner. So my, my aim is to deliver the strategy um, and, and roll that out across the business and we're very much in the early stages of that. So um, a lot of what we're doing at the moment, and I've just joined recently the organisation in August, so, and I'm part time, so two and a half, hour, uh, two and a half hours, <laughs> two and a half days per week, not two and a half hours. Um, so, you know, it, it feels very much right now like we're still in the compliance stage in terms of our maturity. Um, and I really want to, you know, I'm very keen to see the impact of what we can do and create a more inclusive organisation and our culture. Um, and disability declaration is one area that we really want to focus on. And, and some of the things that have come up in terms of the barriers to staff sharing um, that their personal diversity are shared, I think, across, it's not just one, one industry of it or one area, it definitely is shared across all industries. Um, I also work in, in, in business sectors as well, and it's it's the same across there. For me, I think one of the biggest um, concerns I have is we're trying to, as a, as, a, as, a, as a housing association, we're trying to create an inclusive culture, not just for colleagues, but also for our customers, which I'm sure, you know, as with the NHS as well, and, um, and, and at the Job Centre, Carol. Um, but we have a very, very low declaration rate um, in terms of customers. It's much lower. So we've got three, just, just to give you some idea, we've got 3% declaration. Uh, and when you think, you know, one in five people in the UK have a disability, then that's extremely low and it's not representative. So I guess, you know, some really good ideas coming up in terms of how we can get that declaration from um, colleagues. But how do you... How do we also get declaration and it doesn't it's even less kind of of an obligation, I suppose, from customers so that we can make the relevant adjustments in terms of their housing and what we're what we're providing as a service? Sorry, that was really long-winded, but I hope it makes I hope it makes some sense. Yeah, I guess so. Open floor. Does anybody want to come in in, in regards to um, to that? I think just kind of yeah, bomb of a fluid. We've got another sort of ten minutes to, or so in terms of our space here today. But um, yeah, just to if anybody yeah. wants to come in. The way that I have found that I can get that information out of customers, but this is from using work as a perspective it is very specifically which school did you go to um did you have one-to-one -one support at school did you you know are you you saying that you're um going on what Bo said earlier um you're saying that you've got a general learning disability and that you are dyslexic now have you been assessed for that um some people who have been assessed for the general learning disability which is 
basically a lower IQ, have heard the term dyslexic and they believe they've also got that as well, but they haven't been assessed for it. So there is some confusion within that area. I, I'd, I just ask the questions and I don't have a fear about asking them. Apparently, that is why I get get to the point you know i get it open i don't i don't get them to open up rather the there was a guy from one of the mental health services which is part i believe seller trust is part of the nhs um who was in the job center yesterday and i overheard a conversation with him and during that conversation it turned out that the person thought that the seller trust was going to offer a job I had to specifically ask her if she had a mental health condition because that's what um, Seller Trust was there to support people with mental health conditions. And he turned around and he says, I don't, I wouldn't ask that question. I says, but if you don't ask it, how are you going to find out? You've got to have the, you've got to have the ability to suspect it and, and dig until you get to that point. It can take time. Thank you, Carol. Thanks for your perspectives. It's really useful. Yeah. I guess, yeah, it, I guess I Carol, it is, it's also about ensuring that people do feel comfortable sharing yeah. that information, yeah. though, isn't it? Um, it is. And maybe letting them know why why you need yeah. that information. Um, yeah. and, and that it's I because do. you're wanting to help help somebody yeah. with that support. I do rather, agree yeah as well with Shona, yes, we do send mixed messages and unfortunately, Pip, I have no control over. I do know that for invisible uh, for invisible disabilities, there was a programme on one of the TV channels, I can't remember which one, um, that looked into Pip that said, for people who've not got a, a physical disability, um, somewhere around about 70 or 80 percent of PIP applications have to go through to to the tribunal in order to be awarded, which is quite disturbing when you think that the people with the hidden disabilities is are the ones that have got them probably more anxiety, more mental health conditions, which can be affected. And I do I do realise that I do understand that and. There's nothing I can do at that level. I wish there was. I deal with the universal credit side and the ESA side, and I try my best to help my customers. That's all yeah. I can do. You're doing it's a great a big, job. Carol. It's a big department. It's vital yeah. having, you know, people that get it. It's like we we bring our lived experiences in all the laws and spheres as as we do, and you know, going through life, and the more we work, it's. It, there's bound to be a situation or occasion where our health will impact upon our work and it's having the right things in place that you know for everyone and I think um you know just go back to my own experience I know with with my mum when my mum did live with me and I sort of um, worked with her to speak to the advisor it was a for, for a PIP claim she'd had a she couldn't really walk much she couldn't move much and it's that process it, it really can be break people I think so there's something for me and I know it's a little bit off topic but it does come back down to the wider element of declaration because if you feel like you're not believed from the get-go and you're not in the best place to even get up to try and walk however many yards or whatever it is but you do it because you have to kind of sort of you know and for my mum it was in lockdown so it wasn't a physical um session but I think there's a real sense of if people, I think it's having a holistic, wider approach in all elements of the remit regarding disability quality of services feel um, best all around. But I know there's certain people, like I know Carol, in the job centre, my own experience when I, I mean, as universal credit claimant, as a single parent before, and, and actually I'm actually on universal credit even with work because it helps my childcare. So yeah. it's, you can meet some really people that will inspire you and are really just great and I think that's the thing you know it's so important within our spheres um like you said Carol it'll be life-changing some of the you know your interactions with some of the people that have come through that door it will be and you might not know it and I think yeah. that's the, the heart of all this for us is why disability declaration is so important is because for us it's about making sure we're having the right conversations putting the right things in place so um we meet that wider breadth of needs and that wider 
you know and I, I think it's that the it's about that real kind of um, moral and ethical duty I feel within our roles a little bit so Ruth you've got your hand up sorry thank you yeah it's fine so I'm I not just... been putting my hand up I'm just, just coming in <laughs> yeah I'm just reading to the same as well so, but <laughs> I'm just reflecting a little bit on what Tanya was saying about mm -hmm. inclusive cultures and, and also thinking about our relationships within our department, Sonia. Um, I know you're really open um, about um, your, your disability and, and about your caring responsibilities. And from the perspective of a, a team member, and unfortunately, I know not everybody in the organisation perhaps um, has this feeling, but I really appreciate your openness. So as a colleague working with you, I know that you're up against certain challenges every day. And when you, I've, I've, I really I'm so glad that you can talk to me about that and that we can because at the end of the day, it's about getting the work done. But it's also about you feeling healthy and um, not feeling under undue pressure because of other challenges that you've got. So I would hate to think that as your colleague, I wasn't aware of something like that and I couldn't support you and we couldn't talk about it. And what I'd like is for everybody in the organisation to to have that kind of relationship. I know there are certain things that somebody may not want to share for whatever reason and may not need to share. But for me, it, it feels like we're in the right place and we're focusing on the work, but we're also really supporting each other. Um, and you know and and i'm sure that gives you that sense of belonging and that you want to come to work no definitely i think that's that's at the heart i guess of um is a whole approach sort of with the innovation from project with the things that we're doing at the trust within um i mean we're a very small team we have um a head of ida his role split between the trust and his other core work which is sort of separate and bruce part-time i'm part-time at two and a half days but we're quite i would say we're quite a formidable team in that we we've over the space of this year with me coming into sort of within our team we understand each other and we've created that psychological safe space where I know when recently my young son was had to rush him to hospital, I wasn't able to work. It got hands up with our small little team. And beyond that, it was, you know, mum's recently had COVID as well. And again, and it's just kind of like sometimes we have, an, you know, we in our sort of private lives before coming into work, we have so much going on. And work can be at respite, but how do we create a sense where it's okay to say it's a tough day? It's a it's been a tough bloody day, but this is what I need so I can be supported. So it's giving confidence to colleagues to assert what support they might require, but then having that wider, wider sort of in, in environment where it's received well. So there's no sense of kind of you can't say this or you can't sort of share because I think there's a real sense of um within teams that sense of being able to share in a space to then get the work done but you're supported but the wider conversation for us at the trust is to make sure um we create that in a, a, a holistic and a real level because we do know there are challenges but we're, we're doing the best i think we can and we're having the right conversations and putting the right things in place but i think for me this especially with disability quality it's, it's such a bigger conversation it's, it's working with the job centers it's working with the benefits agency it's working with all you know with community centers but it, because at the heart of all this is um, it's, it's people's lives, you know, in terms of patient care for us with our colleagues. Um, I think it's something about um, going back to that, how to best communicate trust value, which is authentic and which 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 can as best serve everyone who comes through that door wants to work for us or in terms of patient care. So, yeah, I think it's I think the conversation is really, um, really great to have the people we've got here today and I think from the festival I know we are we are coming up to um sort of 11 a.m but I'm really excited about what we've tried to do here with the collective with Bo with your organization we've got Zara here I'm just looking at who we've got on the call and our wider partners I think there's a real sense of we will obviously from this festival reflect on how it's gone and look to sort of uh, work with that to um look for next year but I think for me it feels um it's exciting actually because we are, you know, we've all got this pool of expertise and the fields of expertise we work in. But if we pull that together, um, there's a real sense of making that difference on a real level and a meaningful level for Bradford and beyond and within our region. So I think that's at the heart of why I'm in the job I do, why this session today was really important to me in particular and for Ruth. 
Um, and yeah, I guess if anybody, we are at 11 o'clock, if, if anybody has any of the comments or last, last little things, we'll, um, just, yeah. Just wanted to say there's some great things coming in on the chat as well mm -hmm. about, I think we're all in agreement there really, it's about the psychological safety for people. And also there's a point there that Tanya's made around um, leadership. Um, we've talked about training for managers, haven't we? Um, but role modelling, that kind of um, that kind of behaviour where people they are people are being supported, where people are being open, um, and and really, it's it's about the you know if you see if you see that happening and it's role modelled within an organisation, then then you'll start you might start to believe it, um, and it provides that sort of psychological safety, doesn't it? Some great stuff coming in there. Thank you. Yeah. Well, OK, so we'll, we'll take it to close. Thank you ever so much for your open and, and honest discussions, everybody. Great to see you all thank here today. Much, yeah. Thank you.